Right, we've given it five more minutes for everyone to turn up. And while I think we're still expecting a few more people, I think we should kick off. So, first off, uh, welcome to this uh, Modern C++ for Computa Computational Scientists course, um, which is being run as part of the R2 service. Um, over the next couple of days, we're going to go through a number of topics uh, related to uh, C++ and the sort of things it can allow you to do with a combination of uh, lecture style content and exercises. You should have all been sent a notification around signing up to get an Archer 2 account. While that can be useful in this course to make sure everyone has the same compiler environment and debugging issues as we go through a bit easier, uh, it's not absolutely essential, but I would encourage you all to go through that process. And I will be in the background this morning able to approve those requests if you've not clicked the little link and made your safe accounts. Um, on the email, Claire should have sent you all sometime last week. Um, the rough structure of this course is that uh, Maurice is going to kindly take over this morning's uh, sections. So that's going to be an introduction to the language and then classes. And then this afternoon and tomorrow, I will take the remainder of the content. Uh, so this afternoon I'll be loops, containers, and iterators, and then managing resources. And then tomorrow, uh, sort of templating algorithms and lambdas, uh, a bit on linear algebra and some stuff on threads in C++. Roughly, we'll take a session, so a morning or an afternoon for each of those topics. Uh, sorry, at least the topics will take sort of an hour and a half for each of those topics. Um, we'll split into morning and afternoon sessions. So the aim today will be to have a coffee break around 11 o'clock. Um, and then we'll have lunch from 12.30 to 1.30. Um, we'll then have another coffee break around three o'clock and aim to finish at half four today. Um, if there's any questions at any time, please feel free to put a message in the chat here or as has been linked on the web page for the course, we have this, um, I always forget the name of these, it's basically just a shared document pad that everyone should be able to access. I think I've pasted it in case people can't see it. Uh, this is quite useful if the chat gets busy and things start scrolling through and it's hard to keep track of questions or we want to review things sort of at the end of a section of slides. Please put things in here or notes or other things that you think is useful for the group and then everyone can contribute. It should highlight separately for different people and make it clear who's asked what, but it can be quite nice to have as an additional resource. If there's any issues with accounts and logins in this first session, as I've said, please just message me on, on the uh, chat and I will try to do my best to help in the background while Morris is lecturing, so that's sort of a bit of a easier. We also have Jaffrey um, as a member of VPCC able to assist you as well, so that if I have to nip off for five minutes, he will be about also, I think that is all the housekeeping. Ah, feedback form. That's what Claire was asking me to do. At the end of today or tomorrow, we will send around a link to a feedback form. Please, could you provide some feedback for us? Uh, we run this set of courses and review them at every uh, time they're given so that we can always improve and change and review content. Um, please uh, take the time to fill that in if you can, so it's, it's more useful for those who come after you if there's areas we can improve. Right, I've rambled on a bit too much. Um, I will hand over to Morris now to start the first section and just give an introduction to C++. Thank you. Just checking, can everybody see the slides? I think it's taking a minute to move over from here. Oh, okay, other people can. <laughs> Is that okay, yeah. Right. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, this morning we'll take, as it says here, a, a, a brief uh, look through there's lot, lots, of, lots of things popping up here. Just sound checks. Someone's having a slight audio issue. Um, and yeah, like me, I think someone can only see more than C++. 
not right they can't the... they can't they can't see the slide a lot okay. of other people can see your slides though so i think it might just be a lag opposed to an actual problem okay well i'll i, I shall i shall continue um the slides are online anyway if anybody wants to reference them so the the, the Basically, uh, as I said, as a kind of gentle introduction this morning, certainly up until uh, the coffee, the coffee break, um, we we'll have some assumptions we we're making here that uh, you understand another, another programming language. So it's not it's not a programming course. It's it's more a case of understanding how C plus plus works and its nuances. Uh, we also um, base it on uh, Archer, Archer two, and so therefore it, we you know um, to do some of the examples and some of, and some of the uh, instructions we give you are in uh, uh, you know shell um, shell command like bash and um, we also as we go through the course we'll, we'll we'll have some exercises to do so it'd be good to have um, access to a terminal or, or a shell such that you can use the C++ compiler um, what the course isn't um, is uh, basically an introduction to how to write um, computational sci uh, science codes. Um, and that's really about choosing the, the, the appropriate algorithm for your problem. Um, what, what we're doing here is we just want to take a lower level approach and talk about how to use C++ using um, uh, patterns and how to um, help uh, write efficient code um, if you want to know more about how to the algorithmic approach, uh, you could consider some of the other courses, such as the Parallel Design Patterns course that we do in EPCC MSC. Okay, so uh, just as I said there, what what is, what is scientific computing? Um, it's both a case of um, with data science as well, handling large amounts of data, getting large amounts of data from memory to a core, doing something useful with it, and then putting it back. And as we say here, that's why Fortran is still relevant. That's why a lot of codes have been written in Fortran, and so um, we continue to use it. Um, and what we have the advantage here with C++ is we can build higher level abstractions, and we can compose them together um, to to help uh, you know solve our problem. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few of these uh, um, abstractions and give some more suggestions on default rules. As, um, as we go through, th there's a kind of theme that really um, one, one thing that you can do with C++ is use it to describe your problem. So um, C++ is, is large and we could, as it says here, we could spend a whole semester going through it in depth. So we, we picked sort of the, the sort of handful of features that really help you to write uh, useful and modern C++ code. Um, as I say, we, we're not here to teach the whole language and there are many different styles that people have developed over uh, the, the, the decades. You can check online, there's a number, you know, with regards to code, code formatting and particular styles, you, you, there are a number of uh, styles that you can, you can look for online. Sorry, Morris, to interrupt. I think a few of us are still seeing the title slide. Shall I stop? Click the stop sharing button. And get you to reshare in case I think. Yes. Claire shared this initially, and maybe it's a hangover. Okay. All right. If you now try resharing. Can you see it now? That's better. Yeah, I think it was just that. Okay. So okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think it's just she left what she was sharing and therefore held on to it. All right. Cool. Apolog uh, apologies there. Um, we haven't, from the point of view of content on the screen, I think you've really missed, missed too much. Uh, okay. Yes, and as it says here at the bottom, just ask questions at any time and uh, we, we, can, we can go through these. So as, as this image shows, um, C++ is a bit of a misunderstood monster. Um, it's large. Uh, the C++ 20 standard is just over 1,800 pages. Um, it's actually a complex language. It's got many parts. Um, it's based on C um, as classes. It's generics. It has some functional programming features. It has exceptions, and it has a, a vast library. 
Um, as it says here, it, it inspires dread in those who don't understand it. But I think one thing to, to take away from this course is that you don't have to learn all of it to use it. Um, you can pick the, the, the pieces of it that um, fit with what you want to do, and um, you can go from there. And actually, um, when you do get used to it, it's actually quite, it's very powerful, and you can write code quite simply with it. However, it does have its dangers. Bjorn Straustrup is the uh, inventor or developer of C++, and his quote there is, C makes it easy to shoot yourself in the foot, and C++ makes it harder, but when you do, it blows your whole leg off, which is kind of true, but um, I'd like to take the point here to, to mention that when, when it says it makes it harder, there are some features of C++ that actually tighten up on some of the, some of the uh, situations in C that um, are, are kind of um, sort of to do with what we call loose typing. C++ makes that slightly type tighter, and so you'll, you'll get errors in the compiler that uh, you may not have got in C. So that's actually quite useful, and we'll see some of that as we go through. Yes, and as it says, it's, 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 it's um, kind of expert, expert friendly. And that's really because uh, it has such uh, capabilities. Uh, the, uh, the, the quote here by Steve Taylor, I, I believe the full quote is, small talk is uh, an octopus and C++ is an octopus made by nailing extra legs onto a dog. I think it's slightly, slightly, slightly unkind, but the, the concept here is that C++ has had the object-oriented features added to C um, and, you know, that has made it, made it more, more complex. Um, but, as we say here, you, 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 you can... You can cut some off extra legs and, and get the right dog for your program. In other words, what I was saying earlier, you can you can pick and choose what what you're looking for um, and 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 use those features. And as you learn the language more, you can expand and you can you can add um, you know you you can you can add to your knowledge. It, it 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 is good from that perspective. And as it shows here, it's a bit of a it's a bit of Swiss Army knife. You can do a lot with C plus plus. Okay, I mean, um, one, of, one of the jokes is, why is it called C++20? And people say, well, that's because how many legs they had to nail on to fix the octopus. But as I said, I, I, joking aside, I think, I think that's a little unfair. And I think as we go through, you, you'll, you'll begin to see why C++ is used a lot and actually how you can use the, um, you can use the, the flexibility. So um, the philosophy of C++ is that it's general purpose. Yes, you can write a large number of core, um, codes in it. it. It can scale from embedded devices all the way through to HPC. Uh, it can be used to write scientific codes, or it can be used to write applications um, that, that sit on your desktop. So it is very flexible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's about building abstractions. Um, so that you can move yourself further away from the, the nitty gritty of how, how the this, this system actually works. And a lot of those abstractions are provided through the different libraries that are available to C++. The main philosophy behind C++'s design is actually that uh, performance and efficiency are always targeted, as it says here. So you, you pay for what you use. Um, under, underneath the covers of the language, there are a lot of optimizations that are done to ensure that it tries to maximize the, the runtime performance um, as much as possible. It also has a, a powerful type system, which it says here to, to express intent. I, I, I go further and say that once you learn the type system and you learn the features of C++ um, overloading, uh, oper and including operator overloading as well, you can actually start to use the language to describe your problem. And in a, in a sense, uh, C++ can be made to become a language that describes your problem uh, rather than, uh, you know, uh, writing the code and say maybe you would write in some of the other languages. And um, as it says here, communicate with the reader, not the compiler. So, um, but what I would say here is that the compiler does give a lot of useful error messages. It's very informative and actually can help you understand, in the, you know, when you're learning the, the language, what, what, how it works. So 
So it's very much live. C++ is very much live. It's a, it's a work in progress. Um, it says every three years there's a new update to the international standard, which is true. Um, we are currently still in draft for C++23. It was delayed due to COVID. Um, and uh, it's going to include, as it says here, some, some features including networking. And so that's going to be along the lines of the kind of networking features that you find in Java, for example. It's to have more in terms of string formatting, certain things called executors, and a, a sort of consolidation of the new C++20 features. Now, the key point here is that, uh, as it says there, um, C++20 is still not fully implemented by all the compilers. Um, and there, you can you can find out what um, level of compliance each each major compiler like GNU, uh, GCC, uh, Clang or CLang uh, for LLVM, uh, what what they have, um, what level of C plus plus twenty they, they've um, they've implemented. Um, so so you can you can find out uh, what what features the particular compiler you're interested in supports. But I think a, a, a thing to take away here is that the language is evolving. We've got some new features such as ranges, and it says here uh, coroutines and modules. And these help again abstract the language and help actually make C++ much more modern and, and sort of moves it away from, from a lot of its C heritage in a sense because we're able to uh, abstract further. Um, some useful references uh, here. Um, with um, regards to some books, uh, obviously Bjorn Straustrup's um, books are, you know, uh, basically the uh, um, the definition of the language, um, and uh, th so there you could you could say that these are the, the golden reference for that. Um, there's a really good online reference here, the uh, cppreference.com, uh, um, and that that's that's useful. Um, and you can, and as I said earlier there, um, you can find out uh, the level of standard support on that uh, website for most of the major compilers, which as I said, were, was GCC, Clang, Microsoft, as you'll see, plus uh, plus and Intel C++. Scott Mayer's book, Effective Modern C++, is a really good book um, to uh, get your way around C++. Um, it, it's got a lot of a lot of techniques, and as it says, rules of thumb for writing cor correct idiomatic maintainable code. It's it's kind of the the book that most C plus plus developers would would recommend to you as as a book um, to get an understanding of how to write elegant C plus plus code. And obviously, Stack Overflow has a lot of good questions about C plus plus. I'll stick another book reference in the pad uh, at a break. Um, Sam's do a, a Teach Yourself C++ in one hour a day book, and it covers C++ 20 as well as C++ 23 features. It's quite nice. It's got some exercises in it as well. Uh, it's, 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 quite, it's, it's quite a meaty book, but actually I think it's, 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 it's a good reference for covering a lot of the language and giving you some maybe some more insight than you might get with Straustrup's books. Oops. Okay. All right. Here's the um, here's the, the the typical hello world mandatory hello world uh, program that we need to write in all programming languages. Um, and I'll talk you through some of the features here. So. When we look at the, the, the program, um, we see that we uh, have an include statement um, for the IO stream library. That's that standard colon colon C out. And we are basically outputting the hello world string to the standard out. Um, and that's how uh, we, we use streams in uh, C++ to do IO. Um, you can use C functions if you decide. You could use the um, old-fashioned uh, printf statements, but actually, it's generally better to, to use streams. It's, it's certainly the, the C++ way. And we um, compile the program quite simply here, as you can see, using G++. We've said here standard C++11, um, hello.cpp, and then the minus O tells us what the output file is going to be. 
and it's gonna be called hello, that's the binary file, and then we can run it, just dot slash hello, and we get the hello world as we would expect. So just some, feet, just some uh, points here on how the C++ compiler uh, actually performs uh, the compilation, what it does. Um, it runs what we call the preprocessor first. So anything with this um, hash in front of it is a preprocessor directive. And the include, as I said earlier, includes the IO stream uh, ref, um, library reference. So it basically just goes off and finds that file and directly copies it into the current, the current file we're compiling here. Um, and there are conventions, the angle brackets, uh, tell it only to look in the system directory. So you'll see all your system files will be, with, uh, will be referenced here by angle brackets. If it's your own files that you're writing, as we'll come to later, uh, you'll use uh, double quotes, okay? And as I said, the iostream is a standard library header. If you're coming from C at all, you'll notice we don't put the extension on the file. So we don't say iostream.hpp or iostream.h. We just give it the, uh, the, the, the base file name. A couple of other things to note about this example. Um, we always have a, in, a, in an executable file, we always have a main function. That is effectively our entry point to the program. We might write uh, our own, well, we will write our own functions that we will use, but if we're going to call the executable, we always have a main. That's the entry point that the operating system understands and looks for and will call first. So there's another couple of things here. Because this function is called by the operating system, we pass back to the operating system an error code. So that's why it's a type integer and we return zero. Zero in this, ter in, in this case means there's no errors. Um, and uh, so the, the, we, we, when, we, when we return to the operating system, we can check for the errors, but if we ran this code, it would just return zero and the operating system would understand that there's an error. Now, the operating system doesn't handle those for you, but you can then look at those return values in your scripts and you can use that to, to either gain more information about why the program failed or uh, you can then change your process within a, say, a, a shell script based on that return value. These, um, there are a set of standard return, uh, return values or exit values that um, C, plus, C and C++ both use, and they're actually defined in the, in the module uh, CS, C standard lib or CST lib. Um, so you, instead of to return zero, it would be something like uh, return no error or something like that, or error underscore okay. It is, it's basically telling, telling you that um, there aren't any errors and it's more informative than return zero. But having said all that, if, if you look at a lot of C code or a lot of C++ codes and you see return zero as the last line in the main function, you know that that's what it's doing. You know that it's basically just returning that there isn't an error. And as I said, um, the main uh, function is the, uh, the, the the entry point to the program, so they must have exactly one of them if you want to execute it. I, I set aside the fact that if we're building a library, we you know uh, we wouldn't wouldn't have a main function there. Uh, and as I said, the comp compiler and operating operating system arrange for this to be called. And I've I've, I've gone through that uh, about the return statement. The uh, other point here is that you can get command line arguments. So in other words, when you call this from the command line, you can pass in some arguments just like you would to other um, sort of uh, Unix or Linux commands. Uh, you can pass them in and they are passed into the main function by the operating system for you. But here we've used void because that means we aren't using them. So there's there's no parameters being being passed in here. Okay, just to go a, a bit further into um, what this code does, and it's it's it, um, the uh, the the um, with regards to the standard libraries. As I mentioned earlier, we use the C out stream for our output. Um, STD is the standard library namespace. So 
When we say namespace, we kind of think of module effectively. It's uh, it's not quite, but let, 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 we, we, we can use it in that sense. So we have a library that uh, is defined in the standard uh, namespace, and in there, there are a series of functions and streams that we can use, okay? And as it says, a namespace allows us scoping of names, much like a file system has directories. So it, it, it makes things tidier. Uh, we, the double colon is known as the scope resolution operator, and that allows us to access something from inside a, a namespace. So for example, if we had just written um, C out um, uh, left less than less than a symbol, then we, we, we would get a, a compile error because it wouldn't know uh, what C out is because we haven't specified the namespace. And C out rep represents the console output and there's uh, similar for, for, for input as well. Another thing to notice at the end of the line, we can use the standard colon colon end L for end line, and it'll put a carriage return or line feed in um, and basically uh, moves the, 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 the terminal onto the next line. So, it says a standard library uses the bitwise left shift operator to mean stream insertion. Effectively, um, C++, when it's using streams, it uses that operator to mean that you're going to, you're going to concatenate or you're going to put something that's at the right of it onto the stream. So as it says, the output, the right-hand side to the left. So we standard out, uh, standard C out gets hello world, then it gets the end line. Another thing to notice here in C++, like C, every um, statement must be uh, terminated with a semicolon. And uh, the language treats all white spaces, be it spaces, tabs, line breaks is the same. OK. So um, now uh, it, it would be good to, just to have a, 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 a a go for yourselves uh, to try out. Um, as we say, as, as I said here, um, it would be good to have a, a C++ compiler that supports at least C++ 11. Um, and generally, we we you know we, we support uh, Linux. Um, you know, if you're using Windows, you may have uh, the um, WSL or the Windows subsystem for Linux installed, in which case you could you could you could you could compile in there. Mac OS, you should be able to compile if you've uh, installed the um, Xcode Developers Kit. Um, if you don't have access to a C++ compiler on your local machine, you should have login details for Archer 2. Um, the uh, one, once you log in um, to get access to the C++ compiler, the default version on Archer 2 now is GCC 11.2, and that's the command there to, to load the compiler. So you do a module load, GCC slash 11.2.0, and then you'll be able to uh, compile the code. I mean, there are later versions of GCC and Archer 2, but that, that is the default version. Okay. So to get the example source code, um, they're available on GitHub at that location. Um, you can also, as it says, uh, view the slides and other materials in the browser by going to that, that address. Um, so if you want to get uh, the copy of the exercises um, from the command line, you'll need git installed. And then you just put that command in, git clone, and then uh, the URL there for the Archer 2 CPP. And then if you if you want to run that simple program, you do CD Archer 2 into the lectures, into the CPP intro, into the hello subdirectory. And if you want to view the program source, I mean, it says here Vim or Vi um, or Emacs or whatever text editor that, or uh, program editor, code editor that you prefer. And then to compile the program, it's fairly straightforward. It's G++ minus minus standard. That's telling the compiler that we want to use um, C++ 11. And then again, the name of the program, 
and then the output minus O, hello. And if you get nothing, and it just returns with the next command line on 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 terminal, then you've got you've had it's been successful. And if you wish to run it, just type dot slash hello. So. I think it would be quite good at this point for you to have a have a have a have a have a look at that. Um, think about downloading it and uh, making sure you've got the tools so that uh, for the later exercises you're able you're able to actually run them. If um, you've got any issues, just let us know. And certainly, um, if you want to do that over, over the coffee, that would be great. And you can you can have a you you, you know you can install. And as I say, if there's any issues, let let us know and we'll. Uh, will help you out. There's another very useful uh, tool um, on this site called Godbolt, um, where it's called the Compiler Explorer, um, where actually you can type some C++ code on the left, and you can select a, a C++ compiler on the right, and it will show you uh, compiler errors and warnings, and you can actually execute your program. And you can also get you can one, once you're happy with it, you can create a shareable link um, with it um, to uh, to share with people. So that's that's definitely um, uh, worth having a good look at, and it's great for checking your code in different compilers. Um, and the name comes from Matt Godbolt, who actually actually developed the uh, website and compiler. It's a wonderful resource. I, I recommend that when you've got some time, have a look at it. There are also capabilities on there for you to uh, disassemble the code so you can actually see what, what the, the, the actual generated code looks like. And whilst that's possibly a bit low level at this point, uh, as you get more familiar with C++, you might like to actually see what kind of, what kind of code it actually generates and, and uh, that will help you understand what, what it's doing. Are there any questions that anybody wants me to answer? If James, you could maybe read read them out. Yeah. So the um, <laughs> yes, that shouldn't be. Sorry, so I think the questions around um, loading modules and all right on, on the RG2 environment, and I'm just checking that that is actually an available module. Um, have you loaded into the right programming environment? That's the main first question I would ask. I think yes. So, so I I checked um, on Archer 2 at the moment, and that should be the default GCC module. So the command module load uh, GCC slash 11.2.0 should load that version of the compiler for you. Obviously, if you're on your own machine, you don't need to do the module load. If you've already got the C++ compiler installed. Oh, okay, so it's um, I think then <clears throat> the GCC 10.2 may have slipped into a slide. That's fine. It, 11.2 works okay. Yes, it is. I've updated the slides. Um, I've committed them, but we'll uh, we'll merge them in after this. Okay, I'll look at that now if we can. Right. Cool. I've also made some formatting updates, so we'll 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 we'll. we'll, we'll Check it in later, and uh, I will do the merge. But yes, um, it does say on the slide uh, 10.2. But if you use 11.2, that that that's the latest one. That's the one. It's not the latest compiler, but that's the current default compiler. Is there anything else? Yeah, around uh, our, the classic um, main arg c cluster arg v. Um, square brackets instead of void. So right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the so so the, the issue with um, oh, it's not the issue. Okay. So so passing the arguments in from the uh, from the the shell from the operating system um, is set using a C um, basically C uh, 
um, API structure because Linux was is written in C and certainly uh, well Unix originally was written in C. So you have to have two parameters: one which is the count of the strings that are being passed in, i.e. the length of the array, and then the array itself. So that's why there's two parameters in in both in, in C plus and C for the arguments you pass in. By putting void in there, you can you don't need to put void in. You can you can you can actually have open bracket, close bracket, and that means I'm not you're not taking any parameters. But um, in C, if you um, if you have a function name that doesn't have any parameter, it doesn't have void in there, and it's just empty. Um, it could be passed parameters uh, when it's defined. So um, that's a kind of hangover from C that basically then says when if you were trying to call it with parameters, you would get a compiler error. I don't know if that I don't know if that really uh, helps answer the question, but basically, if you're not passing any parameters, it's good practice to either leave the the the, the, the brackets empty on the main or put void in there, just so that you know that you're not passing anything. And if you are wanting to pass parameters, then yes, absolutely, you need to pass an int, and it's generally generally called argc for argument count, and then it's a jar star for the um, for the uh, argv, which is the um, arguments vector. Um, uh, which will contain the strings from the operating system. Does that help? I think that's answered the question. Yeah. Cool. Is there anything else we want to pick up just now, or should we should we move on? Um, in what case do we going... to declare the scope by using namespace? Not sure I understand the context in which the question is asked. So you may, I'll quickly answer that. I mean, we'll, we'll cover some of this stuff off as we go through, but just, just briefly here. The advantage of namespaces is it allows you to collect together a whole series of functions under a single namespace or, or almost, as I, as I said, it's like a module, it's like a library. It's, it's basically somewhere where you can collect a, a, a load of functions or a load of, um, uh, declarations, so that so that then when you load that namespace, you have access to them. It stops you having the situation where I might declare a function called um, add, and somebody else might declare a function called add, and then we're going to have a, a, a compiler error when we try and link the the two files together because we've got two versions of add, especially if they've got the same uh, parameters, the uh, same arguments. So therefore, by putting them in a namespace Morris, then you can say, well, I want Morris's add, so I would do Morris double colon add. And therefore, you would get that version of add, and you know it's that version of add, and not one that's maybe defined somewhere else. It tightens things up. It makes sure that we know where we're getting a function or a symbol, but it also means that we can have, we can have the, the same name used in multiple places, because we can just put it in a, a different namespace. So if you're building a library, you want to have a namespace and put all your functions into 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 that namespace. Does that make sense? Um, I we think can, so just a follow up there was um, sometimes I see using namespace and sometimes it's used without the using. Uh, I'll 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 come to, I'll come to that later, and if yeah, I don't. I um, you know, um, ask me to ask me to 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 explain it again, because as we go through, we'll 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 we'll, we'll see. I think. All right. Okay. I think let's uh, move on. Okay. One one thing that's very important um, with regard to C plus plus is it's a it's a typed language. So as it says, all variables must be declared. So. Unlike, say, dynamic languages, um, particularly scripting languages or languages like Python, where you can just you can just use the variable, um, you you have to actually declare them before you can use them. However, C++ does have type inferencing, so you can often let the compiler figure it out for you, and we'll show you examples uh, as we go through of how it does that. And that's a, that's a, a later, well, I say a later version uh, feature of C++, but it was added to C++. And as I say, because C++ is an evolving language, we're getting lots of these nice features. So again, it's moving quite far, uh, quite far away from C. A lot of people say, oh, well, it's just C with classes. But actually, when you start to look at type inferencing, which C doesn't have, then you, you actually see that, that C++ is adding quite a bit. Um, 
like C, because it's based on C, it counts from zero and not from one, as it says, like Fortran. So just be aware that if you're used to Fortran, um, then you know uh, when you've got a C array, it will start from it will start from zero. You will start indexing from zero. Okay, let's have a chat about variables. Oops. Now here, um, it says a variable is an object. I, I don't want you to think about it being uh, a, an object in the sense of an instance of a class, which we'll cover in classes later. This is just a term for anything in memory, okay? An integer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or it can be a reference. So um, a reference is, as its name suggests, a reference to an object being an integer or any other type. So we can have these two things, and they're declared to have a type and a name. We'll, we'll deal with references later. The, they, they introduce complexity, but they also introduce quite a lot of power, and they are very useful. They also help with efficiency, as we'll see. We'll see why references are beneficial as we go through. So as a definition, what we mean by an object here is it's a region of storage that has a type, a size, a value, and a lifetime. So the type would be whether it's a, 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 an integer number or a floating point number um, or a string. Um, its size would be how much space that takes up in memory. With C++, um, we need to understand that, um, more so with C. Um, so basically, you know, we have different types and they may be either one byte in memory, two bytes, four bytes, eight bytes, and depending on the type we use, they have that size. They obviously have a value and they have a lifetime. So do they, you know, how long do they, they live? They get created and then they get destroyed. And as we go through, we'll see how that lifetime can change depending on what the, the type of the object is. Okay. So let's have a look at types. So as I said, objects, and I think it's important to mention here expressions. So you might think of calculations, you know, addition, subtraction. They have a property of, of type, which um, defines what they can do. So it restricts them, but also what uh, operations are permitted on those entities. and it says here it provides semantic meaning to otherwise generic sequence of bits. Yes, that's true, because everything in memory is just a sequence of bits, and by by overlaying types on it, we can we can we can do the operations that we want. We can do the addition, you know, we we can represent numbers in a different manner. So that's why we have, we have we have types. So there's some fundamental types or. I, I sometimes refer to as, as base types. Now there are, there are quite a, a number more than these, but these 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 are an example. So earlier we talked about void. Well, void means that it's a void. It, it's nothing. It, it, it's used to indicate that a function takes or returns no value. Yeah, and that 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 that's actually unlike some other languages, we actually state that a that a function has no return value by using void. We have a, a Boolean type, and it can be true or false. Um, we have an integer. Um, what's slightly confusing with C and C++ is when we talk about uh, something like an integer, that's a signed integer, and so it could be positive or negative. It's at least 16 bits, but usually 32 bits. So the standard defines what length these uh, types are. Um, but on, it, 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 it defines them in terms of their minimum size, okay? So just sometimes be a, a little bit aware of that. There is a function that allows you to get the size of any type. It's called size of. So if you're not sure, you can always put size of int, if you like, and uh, output that to standard out, and you'll, you'll get the size, and then you'll know for that piece of code you're compiling what the size is. Um, we've got double, which is a double position floating point. As it says, it's usually uh, an IEEE 75464-bit number. 
And then there's in that standard, when we talked about that standard namespace, there's also types. So there's a byte, there's a byte defined in that. And it's a raw untyped memory. In the past in C, you'll see char used for that a lot, which is a character. But that's kind of, um, that kind of um, obscures the situation because uh, with Unicode um, characters, uh, actual characters can be effectively two characters with. So, so we have a standard byte now that we know is eight bits. So um, that's useful and we, we may use that for certain operations we do. And as I said, it's a good example of how you put something into a namespace. There's also unsigned versions of the integer types. So in other words, um, you can have an unsigned int and then you get the full 16 or 32 bits available to you for the number. So the maximum number you can have is much larger than it would be than if it was a signed one, because we've obviously got to have the sign, uh, the, you know, the, the negative representations of them. And that uh, is actually done by the, 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 the most significant bit. The header CST, uh, CST int or C standard int provides fixed width integer types. So yes, you can ask for a specific um, uh, length or, or width of um, you know, your, your integer, as an example here, we, we can ask for a 32-bit int, and that would be a standard colon colon int 32 underscore t. When you see the underscore t, that's a kind of convention to say it's a type that we've defined, okay? And um, there's also another example there of an unsigned 64-bit uh, integer. There are others, um, there's uh, single precision floats. And then when it comes to integers, there's, there's quite a few of them. There's shorts, which are uh, usually 16-bit. Um, longs, which are uh, longer than the, 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 than the integer. And then long, long, which um, can be up to 128 bits. Um, if you have a look in CPP reference, it will uh, give, give you more information on those if you need them. So um, apart from numeric types, we also have strings. Um, and uh, in C++, we actually have proper strings as opposed to C, which is we have an array of characters. Um, effectively, um, C++ uses that under the covers, but it wraps them nicely in a set of classes in the uh, string um, uh, library. So as we can see here, you do a hash include string, and then we can reference the strings. Now, as I said earlier, just going back to that namespaces, we can see this IO stream, and we've included string, and they're both in this defined in the standard uh, namespace. So you can start collecting these things together, as I said, uh, in a single namespace. So we, when inside IO stream, uh, uh, the, the actual header file, it'll actually set its functions or its variables in that standard namespace. So there we are, we, we've got standard string, we've got a message, it's called hello world, and then we can just output that to the uh, standard out. So I mentioned earlier about the uh, standard raw. Um, because of the uh, history of C and C++ characters were originally uh, eight bits, and then we've got more sophisticated encoding. So the character encoding in the library, uh, on the previous C++ libraries was a bit of a mess, but this this is this is this has been partially addressed in C++ 20. So as we're moving forward, we're finding that a lot of these idiosyncrasies you might find are getting ironed out and are starting to disappear, which is why we keep seeing revisions to C++, not just for extra features, but also to go back and, and, and maybe re-implement uh, features that we've already got and uh, fix them. Um, if you want to do a lot of string handling, then you're better using a library such as Boost, which is well known, um, uh, because it, it um, because Unicode, as I mentioned, is, is really rather complicated and it handles it very well. Okay. Let's have a look at functions. So we're generally going to put a lot of our code into multiple functions and then call them. 
So as you would expect, uh, a function encapsulates a piece of code um, between uh, braces or curly brackets, and we give it a name uh, so we can reference it later. So as we can see here in C and C++, um, when we define or declare rather a, a, a function, we give it the return type first. So that's void. So in this example, say underscore hello, we're not returning any value at the function. And we can also see that because we're not got a return statement there. And we're not passing any parameters. Again, we've got void in there. So it literally just says hello world and uh, outputs that to the standard out. And then when we call the function, uh, we just use the function name and open brackets, close brackets, and that then does the call for us. So we need we need these um, we, we we need these brackets there when we actually call the function. Okay. As I said, you must declare the return type and the parameter type. Um, yes, this is so. Parameters are local variables that are initialized by the caller. That that's absolutely true. When we call a function, we have a thing called a stack frame, and these variables get declared in that frame, as do all your local variables. Um, so in in the example here, where we've got int sum. Uh, we've got two parameters, A and B, they're both integer. They get effectively declared in the local scope of the function. That's why we can reference them. That's why we can then say on that uh, uh, following line, return A plus B. And the uh, return value uh, is, is returned, naturally enough, using a keyword called return. And it, it says here, it must be of type of expression, must be convertible. Uh, or, or quite, quite often what we call be able to be coerced to the, the, the returned type. Um, we'll cover some of this later, what, what I mean by coercion um, with types. Um, but, but, but C and C++ do, can do this for you. But as long as effectively we've got a, an expression there in the return statement that will, let's call it resolve or be coerced to an int, then the compiler will compile the code. It won't raise an error. But uh, we've also got another syntax now, um, uh, which was introduced in the C++11 standard, where we call it a trailing return type. It's also known as an east end function. Um, so this is the first site we've had of this auto keyword. I, men I mentioned earlier about type inferencing. Auto is kind of uh, to do with type inferencing, and the compiler would figure it out from what follows. In this example, we're actually giving it a hint here by that sort of uh, right arrow there, int between the uh, closing bracket and the opening uh, curly bracket, the brace. And the compiler then says, oh, OK, I'll, 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 I'll try and work out what the return type of this value is. And then it sees that actually we've told it it's an int and it's happy. So that's another way of um, declaring your functions now. since. Uh, uh, since uh, the, the C11 uh, standard. We'll cover uh, the auto keyword and type inferencing in a bit more detail in a minute. As I said, uh, to use the function, you just provide um, the argument in parentheses, or um, if there's no, no, no arguments, it's just empty parentheses. But if we look at it here, we're calling the sum function there with the value of x and um, a value of 100 and it will then call the function and return the result. The parameters of the function must match the declaration. In other words, the, the, there needs to be two integer parameters here. Um, otherwise, you'll get a compile error. And the, I've, I've already mentioned about the return, uh, the return zero uh, statement. Now, one feature um, of C++ that C doesn't have is that we have what we call function overloading, which means we can have functions with the same name, 
uh, but different arguments and actually different return types. Um, other languages have this. Uh, Java has the ability to have different uh, have, have function overloading, but I, I, if I'm, from memory, I don't think it allows you to change the return type on it. Um, certainly not in older versions. Uh, but here in C++ we can, and this is this is nice because, as I said earlier, we can start to define a language to describe our problem. So here we've got two functions um, called sum, and the compiler knows what types of arguments uh, are being passed to it, and we'll try and find the best match from these two candidates. Um, and as I said earlier, it will try and use any built-in or we can define them ourselves, uh, conversion rules or coercion rules to convert from one type to another. Okay, so um, in, in this example, we have a number of uh, we have a number of, of, of uh, definitions, um, and we also are calling the sum function a number of times. I just take a minute, uh, based on what what I said and have a quick look at it and see if you can work out for each one of those lines what is actually going to happen. Not all of them, a hint, not all of them are going to compile correctly. Okay, I'm just going to check. Uh, I've changed my 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 tab. Can you see uh, a different sli a different slide with the errors on it? I can, yes. Right. So great. So 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 when we compiled that example, we got uh, the first error we got that the call to sum is ambiguous. And note, it actually gives you a lot of information of what it's trying to do. So it says, okay, uh, the candidate function int a int b. Yeah, that, 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 that's a possibility. But I've also got a candidate function double a, double b. And the reason for that is because it can coerce the double to an int. So when we passed uh, d2 and i1, d2 is a, a, a double and i1 is an integer. So it says, well, I could, I could coerce uh, D2 to an integer and call the first version of sum, or I could promote I1 to a double and call the second one. So that's that that that's that's why it now says, well, I can't really work out what which one you want me to use. So you have to be slightly careful with this because you you will end up in this situation. Okay. Um, and it also the next error says, oh, hang on a minute, um, you've passed me name and a file to it, I, I don't understand how to convert that to an int. So it, it was trying to call the first version of the function with int a, and uh, it, it says, I, I can't convert the string to that. And uh, likewise, it says, well, I, can't, I can't do that with a double either. So what's really nice about this is that the compiler is telling you what it's trying to do. It's not just giving you, oh, syntax error and, and then bails out and you have no idea why you've got an error, you're actually getting quite an informative error that you can then say, ah, right, okay, I need to think about that. You might want to write a function that takes a string, for example. You could and you could take one and you could use one of the, the, the C library functions to parse that uh, uh, string to um, create an integer for you or to create a floating point number. You need to do some error handling around it, but you could do it, and you could write another sum function that takes those parameters and would then would then uh, compile. Likewise, you could have a fun you could take have one, depending on the function you've got. You may not want coercion from a double to an integer or the other way around, and you may actually write a functions that that, that 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 manage that for you. But it, as I said, um, just here in this example, you can see that uh, when you get the error, the compiler is really quite explicit about it. And as I mentioned earlier, um, operators are functions. So in C++, we, we also have um, what we call operators. It says for the non-fundamental types and non-base types, they're actually <clears throat> really effectively based on C. So they're, they're defined inside the language in the compiler. So we can um, 
add our own functions to do the operators. So this is an example for standard string. We're, we're, we're defining an operator here, and it takes a reference, which we'll talk about later, uh, to two strings. And they're both um, constant, which means they can't be changed. So in other words, it's not going to change what's being passed, and it's going to return you, it's actually going to return you a new standard string. So you would be able to do what we've got here, um, with the auto data file, underscore uh, data underscore file, uh, we can take the user underscore name and add cs.csv to the end of it. So you can see that we can actually uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of power um, to add capabilities to the language um, with our own uh, sort of user defined types, so that we can um, we can extend we can extend extend the language. As I said, really to start describing our problem, it's not just um, it's not just the, the, the plus operator, minus operator. There are a number of other ones, but we'll cover this in more detail. We also see the use of auto here. The advantage here is that we don't need to define its type. Um, it'll be it, it basically it can work it out from the fact that usernames are standard string, and um, it you know if it, if we didn't use a standard string there, it would work it out from the uh, uh, the .csv inside quotes. One advantage of um, this is we, we, we recommend that you should use, almost always use auto. And the advantage is that we can't have an uninitialized variable. If we had said something like standard colon colon string data file and then semicolon, we would, we would have uh, declared the variable, but it wouldn't be initialized. The advantage of this syntax is because it uses the type inferencing, we actually have to give it a value for it to, to do the inferencing. So therefore, we know that data underscore file or data file is always initialized to a value. OK. Um, the other point is, uh, to do this, we need to have the, the, the right-hand side of that equal sign. We need, to, we need to make sure that whatever we're using there has already been defined. Okay, so we now got to the point where we should consider writing some code. But before we do, I uh, just would like to ask if there are any other questions. I can have a look. Jump in the chat. Um... If I just stop sharing, I don't it, maybe. I can, there's, no, there's nothing in the gallop answer. So um, I would continue. And of course, over um, coffee, I'll, I'll be here to answer any questions people may have at that point, too. Yeah. So here we have an example of, again, uh, a sort of an enhanced uh, Hello World, where we're not only um, outputting, uh, to the standard out, we're also reading in, and that's where that standard colon colon C in, and then we're using the right hand uh, operator, if you like, the shift right operator, uh, to to put that into name, and then we're calling our function, and we're passing the uh, the string variable into it, and it will then output that. It might be worth over. Um, since we're getting close now, I think, to, to our break, it might be worth either taking some questions now and stopping early and for you having to have a look at that and give it a try um, over, over, over the coffee. And then if there's anything that comes up, we can, we can chat about it. But if there's other questions you want to take now, it might be quite good to do that before, before we have coffee. So one is, could you repeat, when is it recommended to use auto? So generally, we recommend to use auto almost always, right? And the and certainly for variable uh, declarations. And the reason is, it forces you to initialize the variable. One of the, the major problems in C is people define, uh, sorry, you know, declare um, variables. So they say something like int x, and then you don't give it a value. Um, and it, in C, it's even worse if you're using things called pointers, because if you don't give it a, a, something to point to, we get what's called a null pointer exception, and your code crashes. So by using auto, 
um, and then putting something on the right hand side of the equal sign, then it means that we're we're initializing that variable. We know when we come to use that variable, it has a valid it has a valid value, or at least has a value. We can we can have the debate about whether it's valid or not, but at least has a value. Whereas if you don't do that and you just say int x, the value is uh, could be undefined. I see the question there. It says, but will I know the type? Um, well, generally, in the examples we've got there with the, the, with, with the, the fact that we've, we've used the uh, standard string, yes, you would. Um, but yes, I, I, I guess if you're calling a function and you don't have access to the function, you won't necessarily know. If it matters to your algorithm, then, 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 then yes. Um, but I would still recommend that if it matters when you declare it, you 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 give it a you still you still use the same kind of syntax and make sure it has a value. It's really important that you have a value. But there's a lot of cases where it, it, it isn't important because the other thing is we'll come to when we talk about classes. If you use auto, you could you could substitute a class. Uh, there are other ways of doing it, but auto allows you to do this, and you could change that class. And you could use a different object that's still compatible, uh, and you wouldn't have to go back and recompile your code. Sometimes putting the type information in there and hardwiring it means that it's harder to make changes later in your code because you've, you've, you've baked it in. And certainly when you come to use classes, you may not want to do that. But I understand for scientific codes, then you may want to know. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a trade-off, which is why we say almost always. I'm going, I'll take the last question first. Yes, so I, I, I probably uh, jumped over that a little bit too quickly. So the two header files are there because they basically give us access to the functions. Um, and you're absolutely right, in those header files, they are declaring uh, those uh, functions in the standard namespace. So that's, that's, that's specifically what they're doing. They're, they're saying uh, each of them are part of the standard namespace. Yeah, so it, it allows you by having the different fun, uh, the different files, the different header files. It means you don't have a massive header file for a massive library. You can have a whole series of header files, allowing you to break it down into areas of functionality. Even though you may have a load of symbols or, or variables or functions in the same namespace. So in that case, yes, they both declare them uh, inside the uh, inside the same space. On slide forty one, how can we add Input to the argument say hello when it was defined with void. So, well, the an the answer to that is you can't. You could use a global variable, but I don't recommend it. So, in that case, what you would do is you would pass string as a as as an argument or a parameter to uh, the uh, the um, the function, the, the say hello function, and then you could you could you could add it in there. Is that okay? I know we and some it felt like we we, we counted through some of that. Is there, are there any other uh, questions anybody wants to wants to ask? Oh, that is an error then. You're absolutely right. Yes, that example's wrong. Needs to change. It should be. Should the it should be uh, added to? Oh, well, that actually, <laughs> that that could be an exercise for the reader. I think I think the idea is that um, you should go and try and do that yourself. But I've already given you a, a way of doing it. It, it, it was Luca. Uh, auto var one. Uh, 
para sec. Yes, yeah, it needs it needs something on the right. It can't it can't infer the type, which is why I keep which is why I keep mentioning type inference for for auto, um, because that's exactly what it is. Um, it's base it's a, in a similar way Python kind of does this under the covers for you. So if you were to declare x and give it a value of three, it would it would infer that it's an integer. Yes, it has no initializer. That's what's what it's called. Yes, it can't. At that point, it can't. It's not. So it's not a, so. The, the, this is an important point. I think it's a, it's a really good question, Ben. Um, C plus plus is not a dynamic programming language. Okay, it's a stat. It's a static programming language, and therefore, um, whilst it does type inferencing, it can only go so far, because it's going to bake in that type when it compiles it. Unlike um, Python, which is an, is effectively interpreted. It runs on a form of interpreter or virtual machine. Um, and so therefore, it, it can infer sometimes that later. So it doesn't always care. It can set it to none and then worry about its type later. But uh, C++ can't really do that because it's going to have to allocate the space in the frame of the function, the stack frame of the function. So it needs to know the type. And so therefore, that's why you have to give it an initializer. It's not a dynamic language. It looks a bit like it, and that's part of the reason why they added auto, because it makes it easier, but it's not a dynamic language. So you do you do have to give it a value there. Does that help? I think with that, let's take a 15 minute break now and give Morris Chance to get a cup of tea. Um, that would come back that, at 11. <laughs> that, that would be fantastic. Thanks very much and uh, look, look forward to catching up again at 11. Should we kick off? Yeah, let's, let's kick off. Um, just to let everyone know, I can see the, uh, the chat now, so we should, um, I should be able to answer those uh, more directly now. I'll just uh, share my screen. Just before we actually um, kick off with classes, I thought I'd, I'd put um, some more links in the uh, pad document, uh, basically to the Pearson book I was talking about, um, Teachers of C++ One Hour a Day. It's good because it covers C++ 20 and 23. Um, as I say, it's, it's maybe a reasonably expensive book, but it is, it is pretty meaty and does have a lot in it. Um, for those that are really interested in the standards, the standards committee uh, documents are all here. It's probably a bit much, but you know you might want to look at the the, the draft. Um, so I've put those there, and also um, in in the in the slides in the previous session, there is a link to the CPP reference where it talks about the standards. If you click on that link, it gives you this table, and it shows you all the the features of of C plus plus twenty and what the state is of the compilers, you know, red is obviously it doesn't support it. Uh, amber or oranges or yellow rather is is partial support, and green is fully supported. So, you know, uh, you can have a look there and, and tailor uh, what uh, functionality you're using depending on the compiler, or if you're going to use a number of compilers, you might want to just double check there. Anyway, I thought it would be quite it was quite good just to show you that that table's there and it's useful. And as I say, the link is in the, the previous document, the previous session rather. So um, now we're going to talk about classes. I think the interesting thing about interesting bit about C++. I think I think uh, this is where we get some real value from the language. So as I said, there's there's quite a lot to cover, and it may some of it may be complex. So so as I say, don't don't hesitate um, to put questions into the chat, and I will um, answer them best I can. So classes are user defined types, and I usually like to call out this explicitly. What I mean by that is, if you look at uh, classes as types, um, then it, I think it helps you model your problem better. And as it says here, class types formally can be defined either with a class or struct keyword. Um, 
Now, C doesn't have the class keyword, but it does have the struct keyword. So this example here, um, struct complex, would compile um, on, on C. Um, and this is often known as plain old data type or a trivial type. Um, it's an aggregate type, so it basically aggregates several what we call members, um, which have a name and a type. You can then pass them around together and access the data. Now, um, I mentioned the uh, Godbolt uh, Compiler Explorer earlier, and uh, if we click on that link, this is what we see. Um, hopefully, you can manage to see it, but there's code on the left, um, as we see, is that complex and we've got a default main. Then this is the generated code in the middle here. Um, so this is the actual machine code for an x86. And on the right-hand side, we get the errors. We can determine, we can define or choose what standard of the compiler, and we've set this to C++11. And we can select a whole number of different compilers to find out what, what they would support and what they would generate. Um, I'm pretty sure it supports risk fives even. Um, have a quick look. Yes, there we go. So if we wanted to see what was happening, what the code would look like if it was compiled for a risk five processor, then that's pretty much it. And actually, I think if you look at it, what it's actually done is um, not defined the, the complex because it's not been called, but that's neither here nor there. You can see the generated code here. So this is a really useful tool um, and probably something you could play with. Um, I think it's really good for learning about uh, C++. I think it's good about learning for learning what uh, what um, it generates. And there's a number of other languages and uh, frameworks that, that, that can be added in here. So it is a really brilliant piece of uh, uh, code, a really, really good application. So jumping back. So we've already talked about the built-in types, and we also talked about one of the, the provided type standard string. But here we're, we're defining a complex number. Now there is a in in C in the later versions of C there is actually a complex number defined, but we'll use the the, the example here. So, oh, that's okay. It's just people join the session. Um, To create these trivial types, we can give the class name, then the list of the values to be assigned in order inside the braces. We call this aggregate initialization. So if we look at that uh, code there at top, that function make imaginary unit is actually um, returning a complex number uh, cl uh, object. An object is an instance of a class, and it's setting the uh, real number, real part rather, of it to zero and the imaginary part to one. And uh, we can also do it by having it uninitialized and then we can uh, dereference the, 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 the members uh, individually as we see here with the square root underscore m1 dot re equals zero and the square root underscore m1 dot im equal to one and then return that. So these are the two uh, uh, sort of approaches to um, initializing them. Uh, and again, we can, we, 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 we can see how we can use them. So we've created one there using the complex z equals make imaginary unit. And then that assert command our function is just checking to see whether the dot real is equal to zero. That's the equals equals. That's a, a, a comparison um, against zero. And if it's not, it will e exit uh, because that's what assert does. And likewise, it does the same for one. So we can we we can we can check to make sure that uh, we have actually um, initialized that object the way we the way we want. And as I said, this this um, method of, of of declaring them and uh, accessing them is similar to other languages and the same as uh, C. So.
So talk a bit more about creating instances. Um, and a lot of this is to do with the fact of how uh, C++ manages memory. And we'll see this as we go through why the, this is important. So there are different ways of creating instances. So you can provide, as we said here, default uh, values for um, member variables. So we can say that they're both set to 0, 0.0. And that means then that when we create one, we know that it has uh, an initialized state for us then to use. No, it, uh, assert actually exits the the, the code. It, it's a it's a it's an actual uh, function that that basically does the check and then does it does does it does it, doesn't does an exit. So that the question there, sorry, was if assert fails, does it return a non-zero code? No, it just exits. So we said, why should? Well, the compiler will generate code for you um, that sets the defaults whenever you create the objects. Um, you, you, you can. Yes, you, 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 you could. Um, you could. Sorry, the question there was, do you remove later asserts from the code and write tests? Um, you might write the asserts as actually part of your tests, and you may decide that when you've got production code, you don't call them, and there are mechanisms for doing that. Um, so yes, sorry, going back to what I was saying, um, the advantage of doing it this way is you can't forget to, to set them up. Um, that's why you should, you should use default values, but why th there are examples why you might not want to do it. And it comes back to what I'm saying about managing memory. So perhaps your types are much like the built-in types as possible, but if they're complex, um, they may involve, they may incur quite a runtime cost. Uh, for initializing the variables, which you may not want to pay, well, you may not want to pay that cost when you're initializing the the, the 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 object. You may want to do that later. So it's a trade-off of when you um, on complex uh, code um, with complex classes, where you do where you pay for that initialization. Do you pay for it upfront, or do you delay it and do it at some other point? Uh, there's a whole there's a there's a whole sort of set of reasons why you may want to choose that. But generally, I would say if you can, and certainly for something like a double like that, I, I, I would give it a value that is meaningful for that for that type. OK, this is true. So for um, C++11, you lose the ability to set the member variables by providing the values. So in other words, this code if you set the standard to C++11, will, uh, will, will, will fail to compile with an error, with an error similar to what is, is stated there. <clears throat> so the reason for this was that um, the initialization of objects um, happens uh, in, a, in a set process between constructors and default initialization. And um, they wanted to remove this because it, it wasn't quite correct um, at this point. Once that was fixed, it's been added back. So if you're using the latest version of the compiler and it uses the C++20 um, standard, you won't get that error, and that will that will compile fine. So it, it's just a case of they realized there was an issue at that point when they were doing C++11 and said, no, we're not going to allow it just now because it's, there are certain instances where this is, this, is, this is not good. And then once they were able to, to resolve that, they added it back into the standard. So as I said, the C++ standard is kind of um, fluid. And you might say, oh, that doesn't sound very good. That doesn't sound, you know, that sounds like, whoa, you know, it, it changes. Yes, it does. But you, generally what they do is they change it and make sure that it should behave properly. And so therefore, um, and there's a lot of complexities when we create um, classes. In this example, it's fairly trivial, but it, it may not be trivial, and that's, that's why that happened. But as I said, you don't, with C20 onwards, you don't really need to worry about that. And as I sort of alluded to, often you want to control the creation of the instances of your classes. So we we have um, features called constructors. In a sense, they're special member functions, and and we use that name function loosely with the same name as the type. And um, we 
we, we, we in this example here we have complex we have three um, constructors so we have the default one which is the the first one there with complex open brackets close brackets no parameters equals default then we have complex that takes a double for the real value and then we have another one that takes both the real and the imaginary values okay um, now the default constructor needs no arguments okay and effectively that's kind of called in the background for you by the compiler if we define one then we need to get we need to put default in there okay um, because then we we uh, the compiler needs to know that that that, that there's one being defined So it gives us the ability to control more detail um, rather than just starting with a, a default initialized values. So, so somebody can, can have one line that says uh, complex brackets, you know, um, I don't know, 2.3 comma uh, 1.1 or something like that. So they don't have to do a second call that then sets these. They can actually just go ahead and create the complex object with these, these values. So that, that's, that's useful. And it gives us access to all the member variables, um, you know, to set. As I said earlier, they're, they're not strictly functions, but we can consider them as such. Um, and why do we explicitly have to uh, set the default, uh, tell it it's a default constructor? As I said, it's because actually the language rules say that if the user provides any constructors, so we've provided two others, then um, the compiler will not create a default constructor unless we tell it. And that's why we put default in there. We're telling the compiler, go and create a default constructor on our behalf. Okay, so as I said, um, constructors are function-like in the sense that we declare them like functions, but they're not directly callable, they don't return the value, and they can do initialization of the member variables before the body begins execution. This is, this is really uh, quite an important point here to understand. And um, this, again, as I said, it, 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 it's, it's quite subtle. So when we look at the um, two uh, constructors that we uh, declared just now, just earlier there, the first one, if you look at it, you notice there's no body to the actual uh, constructor, but after the, um, the, the, the sort of header and the, uh, the parameter list or the argument list, there's a colon. And then we have the syntax where we see RE open bracket real. Uh, close bracket and what that's doing is setting the uh, real re member uh, variable to the value of real which is being passed in okay and the, the one following does exactly the same but does it for both of the member variables now it seems slightly strange why do we do this here but it's it's due to the fact that before the, the code any code that would be in these braces gets executed, these, these, these are set up. And for complex cl classes, this, this is important. Um, and so we, we tend to put our actual initialization um, in, that, in that first line there after the colon and before the brace to ensure that the objects are properly instantiated, created before we use them. And it's really that we want to do as much of this initial initialization as early as we can. There are times when we can't. So in other words, we may have to go and call another function or we may have to do something that changes that initialization of that member variable and therefore we would put it inside those braces. But where we don't have to do that and we can just set the value, we, we, should, we, should, we should use these initializers as, as shown here. So based on the above, we can now create com complex numbers in different ways. Somebody's calling out, can they hear everything? Can everybody hear me okay? Somebody just pops a note. 
Yep, cool. Thanks. So um, here we have a, a number of ways of creating a complex number. And as you can see, um, the first three examples, we're using the auto keyword, and it's doing type inferencing based on the fact that on the right-hand side of the equal sign, we, um, we, have, uh, we, 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 ha we have the type. So the first one just uses the default member initializers, so that's just empty braces. Uh, the second one is actually setting the first um, L, uh, member variable, the uh, imaginary, to uh, um, 3.14159, and the second one is setting them to 0 and 1. And then the, the last one is quite subtle. The last one is actually calling one of the constructors. And it looks strange because we, we, we see it and we think, oh, well, what's it doing? Well, actually, it's calling the, constru the constructor that takes one uh, double or, or, or floating point, or real rather, uh, value, and, and then creates a new object for us. So um, when you see that uh, kind of syntax, more often than not, it is actually calling a constructor on your behalf. OK? OK, so whilst we can um, define uh, member variables, um, we can also define uh, member functions. So as we mentioned earlier, object order programming is one of the major paradigms that uh, C++ supports. Um, and OOP, or object-oriented programming, uh, is based on the concept of objects, um, which, as I said, are instantiations in C++'s terms of a class. So we define a class, and then we, we construct it using a constructor, and we get an object. And they may contain data and code. So the feature of objects is that the procedures can access and modify the data of the object with which they're associated. Okay. In C++, we refer to these functions as member functions. So we have member variables and member functions. Java calls them methods. Um, so you may see that in other languages, um, you'll, you'll see these functions referred to as methods. But generally, in uh, C++, we refer to them as member variables. Uh, sorry, member functions. Um, so we have an example there, um, as we've we can see we're actually calling the uh, member function or method size on the uh, string name. And the fun that that's been de 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 defined, and that will return the number of characters in the string name. Okay. So, um, how do we how do we de declare um, member functions? Well, typically we declare them in the class definition. So uh, here we see that uh, we've got a, a a member function called magnitude, and um, for brevity the, the constructors are as they were before in the other examples. So they would actually be here. Um, we've just left them out for. Um, clarity. Now, when you look at the first comment there, the double slash um, means a comment in C++. Um, line is a comment, much the same as a hash in a shell script or a Python script. And what we're saying here is this is inside the header file complex.hpp. Um, the, the, the convention um, generally on Unix or Linux for C++ is that header files have the extension .hpp and um, the kind of body files where we actually define the functions or, or member functions uh, is .cpp, as we'll see in a minute. So this is in, in the header. And we define them, in other words, where we say what they do, or where we 
we write what they do is done as i as i said we, we define them in the cpp file so we have two files complex hpp the header uh well dot h is generally used for um for c and hpp is generally used for c plus plus it's a uh, it's a naming convention some some platforms don't even use cpp they use they use other extensions like possibly cxx but um in, in, on this course, and generally, I would say, on, on a Unix system, uh, be that Linux or Solaris or some other similar uh, Unix, it, it usually is HPP and CPP. And if, if I was writing C++, I would use .HPP simply because it reminds me when I see it on the, on, in a, in a file, on the file system, I know it's a C++ header, not a straight C header, okay? So I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would use it .HPP just to answer that question. Um, right, so uh, as I was saying, so now we have two files. We've got complex.hpp and we've got complex.cpp. Here we actually are defining the function. We can see that it's effectively doing a square root of uh, the, um, you know, multiplying the, the, the real element and adding the imaginary numbers. Um, what's important here is that inside these member functions, uh, we can access the data or functions by just using the names because effectively where we've used where we see that complex colon colon magnitude we're effectively defining that inside you could see it as the namespace of 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 the complex number class so similar to namespaces we're declaring magnitude inside the object the class rather of complex so therefore it knows all the the functions uh, member functions and member variables in there know the names so we don't need to explicitly uh you know uh, put them in uh, we can just we can just reference them there's another another um point to take away here is that implicitly and i i don't want us to dwell too much on it but it's 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 worth seeing, and I'll stick a, a link to it. It's in it's, if you've got the access to the the slides um, in the, the Git repository, you'll let the, the links in the in the comments here. But um, uh, I will put it in the, the pad. But basically, what under the covers, what C is doing is adding an implicit this pointer. So C refers to the current object we are working with by a variable called this. So effectively, it would be this. And then we would dereference that dot re is effectively what's happening here but it does this for you under the covers but if you want to know more about it there's a tutorial on learncpp.com that uh, talks about this in more detail but for now we'll just we'll just move on as i said outside the class we need to have an instance to use so an object and then we can um, in this case because it's public we can dereference the magnitude function and call it Uh, ben, yes, that's correct, and we'll cover that in more detail. So the question there was, it's defined as const because it's not changing in, anything in the object. That's correct. So um, you can, we can, we can say that we're not changing anything. So when we look at that line there, double complex magnitude open brackets void const that const at, uh, in, in between the, the the closing bracket and the opening brace is actually saying we're not changing anything in the complex object. We're using the uh, member variables, but we're not updating them. And that's useful. There, there, there can be optimizations done because we're not up, updating the um, uh, uh, object itself. Plus, um, we can get errors if we then try to update it. it. It's good practice to try and make everything as const as possible. So the compiler then say, why are you doing this? Uh, you know, in certain cases, we don't want to be updating the actual object. You know, we just want to do something with it maybe return a new object, but we don't want to update it. So yeah, that, that's exactly the reason. Right. So I mentioned earlier that we have this uh, feature called operator overloading. So we would expect the usual arithmetic operations like plus, minus, multiply, and divide on complex numbers. And we, we, we can do that. So we can provide um, operator overloads, as we can see here. 
Again, this is a definition of the um, the, the complex number struct in this case, uh, which is which is a class. Um, but we, we're just again the the, the previous uh, members we, we've just taken out for brevity here. So I'm just looking at that question. Can we compare two double straights other than problem C++? Mm, well, yes, yes, in this case. Um, I, I don't I don't want to go into this in too much detail just now. Um, maybe pick that up, that question up more at the end if we have time. So, cheers, thanks. Uh, remember that when I was talking about these operators, they effectively they, they effectively are func these are functions just with you know slightly strange names, and we have to use that operator keyword. Well, if we didn't use the operator keyword, C++ wouldn't know that we're trying to define an operator, and therefore would give us a compiler error. So um, with the um, operator plus equals, so what we want to do there is um, we want to obviously take the current object and we want to add an increment effectively from another complex number and return the new value. So we, we, we do that, as we see, by passing in a constant reference to, the, uh, the, to a, a complex number object, which we're calling increment. And we don't want to change that one that we've passed in. So hence, we've used a constant reference. Uh, thanks, James. And um, we've, we then increment, effectively, the real uh, and imaginary member variables by uh, the amount that's in the, uh, the increment object we, pa we pass in. And here's what I was talking about by this, this, this uh, variable. It's not, be, it's not declared anywhere in this function because C++, as I said, uh, declares it for us. It actually passes it as the first parameter to all functions. It's a bit like Python does if you've used classes in Python. And so, so here what we're doing is we've updated the, this object, and then we return a reference to it. And that's what that complex ampersand is, the type, uh, the return type of this operator. So that's a nice way of us um, actually, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, incrementing uh, the, 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 the object, but also shows the use of this. So that's why it's, it's useful to know that this pointer exists because it, we can use it in this situation. And um, where in the second example, where we've got the um, returning a new object, and we're using the initialization, and we're doing a, um, a, a, a plus. Um, we, we, that actually gets uh, resolved internally. And um, we, if there was a plus uh, operator when, sorry, you know, when when we're calling it um, the uh, two addition addition of two complex numbers, uh, then it would call this operator. Effectively, it, it, it's turning the plus operator into a, a function call. Yes, uh, you you can use this anywhere. In, uh, in a, sorry, the question was, uh, can you use this operate in the operator plus definition? You can actually use it anywhere in a member function of a class. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it's just that's. The reason I'm pausing is I think the answer is no, you're right. That's because it's declared outside and it's not in the effectively the, the, the scope of complex with complex colon colon on the front of it. So no, it's just a function that can take two separate complexes. So you're right, the, this wouldn't be there because it's not it's not actually uh, a member function per se. It's uh, it's it's just a function that uh, is, is, an, is an overload. Yeah. So you're right. So yeah, we, we have to be slightly careful with where uh, what when we declare it, and that would be a good example of where you, if you're if if, if you're not careful, you may think you've declared it as part of uh, the, the struct and therefore access. Well, if you try to access this, it'll give an error. But you you need to be quite clear and careful when when you're actually defining them, declaring them. 
So all this is just an example to show how we can use them as we would expect. Um, we can see there that Z is doing a plus equals and we, you know, as we've defined, and we can see also that uh, that auto C equals Z plus I is actually doing the arithmetic, just, just as we would expect. And we could uh, add uh, multiplication and equality as, as required. If you want to see all of the um, uh, overloading, operator overloading um, operators, then uh, there's a good list on CPP reference. We can also we can also do more than just you know arithmetic operations. We can do copy con copy um, constructors, for example, where we we copy a, an object and return a new instance of it. Um, we can we can do casting operators so that we can control how we uh, cast from one object to another. Um, that can be useful for certain things. We might have to do particular operations. So there, it's worth having a look at that. One, one you might want to think about is what happens when you cast it to a string, because that's quite nice for a complex here. We would probably want to print out both the real and imaginary member variables. And so we'd write a function that would do that. And then we would write a, a casting operator to do that. Yeah, so that when we then put it into a stream to be output to standard out, it would actually print both of them if that's what we wanted to do. But 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 we can we can do that with with casting operators. Yes. Sorry, Lorenzo. Yes, that's right. If if if, it, if we had declared it as part of uh, effectively a member variable, a member function of a complex, the operator plus, as you've shown there, then then this would be available because it now be a member function, and it would automatically be passed this. It's a bit. It's in some in some ways the fact that it you don't see the parameter in the in, in the member functions is that you don't have to declare it is possibly a little a little confusing because although it's there and it's nice you don't have to worry about it in some ways if if this was always ha always had to be defined as an argument or a parameter then at least you would know it was there or not there yeah and I so in some senses I can see the uh, the sort of Python approach where you where you where you where you, where you put it in uh, but for similar reasons to Python it's it's uh, it's it's not there okay moving on classes and structs and this is quite important I think to understand uh, generally. Struct and class keywords are technically the same. The only difference is what we call the accessibility, the default accessibility of members. So we have different uh, accessibility um, keywords and capabilities for member variables and uh, member functions. They can be, as it says here, public. So they can be usable for any piece of code, i.e. Um, it, this, this is the public interface of the class, so you know um, we we can call the methods that we expect or the member functions we expect. This is default for struct. In fact, everything in struct is is public by default. Okay, so it, the reason for that is it makes it then very similar to um, C if you uh, are using just plain old data objects where there's no member functions but just member variables. Private means it's only usable from the context of a class. So in other words, we use this to hide the implement deta implementation detail of a class that should really not be of any interest to code outside that uses it. And this is the default for class. So everything's private in a class unless you change its accessibility. And restricting the access to implementation is part of encapsulation. I mean, this, this is a key element that under underpins object-oriented programming is, uh, you know, generally it's um, uh, uh, encapsulation and inheritance. Yeah, uh, and we will talk about possibly touching inheritance later. But 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 encapsulation is one of the key things, and it makes allows us to make more should allow us to to make more resilient code, and also helps with modularity because we should only be interested in the public interface of a class, not how it was implemented internally. The other advantage of uh, using a public interface through a set of functions is that we can change the internal representation, as we call it, of the class 
and we shouldn't have you should the, the, it should just be a recompile there shouldn't be a change of the code that calls it so in other words we may decide to use an integer for an internal um, variable a member variable if we make that private we can provide uh, entities, entities space functions that uh, call uh, that, that update it and we could change it to a real number and we could manage that in those member interface functions without having to effectively change what we would call the application programming interface for the calling code. The calling code wouldn't know that we've changed that representation. So it's one of the advantages of making all your, your, your data private. There can, there can be, I will touch on private and protected class members in a sec, in a minute or two. Um, the advantage of, of, of making all data private, as I said, is, is for encapsulation and for maintainability. Um, there can be downsides because then you're having to use a function call to access the data. But generally, you should, you should make all your, your, your data private. So here's an example. Um, in this example, uh, we uh, would actually get a compiler error because um, we haven't defined, declared, um, we haven't defined um, say hello as public, as private. As I said, for a class, everything is private by default. So when we say g dot say hello in test, it can't access say hello because we haven't made it private. Now, another member function of greeter could call say hello because it's, it, it has access to private member variables and private member functions, but something outside the class can't access it. So that, that, that's how um, effectively we're, we, we can do encapsulation. So to get around that, we would uh, use the public keyword here so everything that follows that public colon is now public everything everything will be public until and, and until the the, 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 the the brace with the semicolon or we use another access modifier as it's called that changes it to being private again or some other um, level of um, access control so now we can compile this and and now we, we would get what we would expect Okay, as, as, as I mentioned, the um, encapsulation enforces modularity and we can swap out. So in complex classes, we can actually end up swapping out one uh, piece of the implementation for another. So we may actually make something uh, higher performance, but we're not having to change what we call the client code or the code that actually calls it. So that's back to what I'm saying. It's about enabling us to change things without impacting uh, a large amount of code that is the what we quite often refer to as client code, which is the code that calls it. We also have um, another relationship, which is uh, the friend relationship, okay? And we can declare um, a, another function uh, or class to be a friend. Now that allows it to have access to its private member variables. There's a lot written about not using friend um, relationships, and generally you shouldn't, but it's a controlled partial relaxation of the encapsulation, which allows us to make the whole system more isolated and is partly <coughs> used um, to support iterators because they need to have access quite often to the internal representation of a class. But generally, um, you, you don't really want to be using friend relationships unless you really have a good reason for them. Um, I would generally say that you should make all your data private unless there's an, an actual performance reason. But even then, I would argue you should consider that. And I would make, you know, I would have some functions that do some operations that are calculations, et cetera, that may be compound and make them private as well. And then have a public interface to them that allows you to have a nice standard interface that, uh, that programmers can use.
So we've 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 seen um, the use of the const keyword a number of times. So it's worth I think going through this in a, in a bit more detail. So refer to this as constness, which in C++ is, is important. So uh, variables can be qualified by the const keyword um, and as was mentioned in, in the chat earlier, um, objects marked with const cannot be modified. Um, and by objects, we mean things including int. So in this example, um, we declare the int i as constant, and it's equal to 42. So we can use it, we can access it, and we can get, when we do a C out on it, we get the print, for, we'll get 42. But when we try and increment it, we get an error because it's, uh, it, it's, it's a constant. And as we see here, you should add const to your local variables wherever possible. I would argue it's even wider than that. You should try and make everything as const as possible unless you don't need to, yeah? Um, because there can be large uh, sections of your code that actually shouldn't be updated once they're, they're, they're defined. Is argv a const implicitly in the compiler? No, <laughs> is the is the answer. Uh, it's a copy. It's on the, fra the stack frame, so it, it, you know it's possible to update it. I don't recommend you do. Um, but uh, no, it's not implicitly const. Um, okay. Yeah, just before I go over this here, just just to, just to add to the the, the, the sort of previous slide here, um, there are a number of things that obviously we'd expect to be const. You might, for example, you you might want to set the value of pi um, to being a particular, uh, you know, three point one four nine, three one four five nine, etc. Um, we also may want to uh, get a single value for the execution of that code block, okay? Um, we mentioned here that it possibly may speed it up, um, but um, you're giving really something a name that you can refer to it again, and it won't you won't accidentally change it. And it's, it's, it's really beneficial to do this so you don't use magic numbers in your code. Um, so, so for example, you know, you don't, you, you, if you have local mean density, uh, you, you can set that to a constant, and um, it's quite likely that the compiler will just insert the value for it in wherever you reference it in the code block that you've got. But at least it's no longer, you know, a sort of magic number. It's something that you've given a meaningful name, which will help you to um, to maintain your code. So it's a good, it's a good practice to do, you know, to to, to basically set constants. Um, and if you're not going to change them, make sure they are actually set to const. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, um, effectively function parameters are, are just local variables. Um, and so we can make them const too, as we see here. And since this function has no need to modify its arguments, they should be marked as const. Uh, just furthering what I'm saying about it. try and make everything as const as possible. This becomes important when we start using references, as we'll see in a moment. So um, I think it was Ben earlier that mentioned this. Um, if we don't need to change the instance of the uh, um, Object that we're we're we're, we're um, co you, you know referencing in a member function, we should use const, and then we know that it's not going to change it. And again, it's good practice to do this. Anything that returns a value based on the object but doesn't change the object, we we should we should we should mark it const.
Okay. Um, C++ being C++ um, quite often uh, has multiple ways of, of doing things. So as far as the compiler and the language specification are concerned, uh, these um, are identical. So you can say const int i equals 42 or int const i equals 42. Now the, um, pardon me, the former version is more like what you would do in C. And the rule is const applies to what is on its left unless nothing is on its left. And then in which case it applies to what is on its right. And if we go to the right, it says always put const on the right of what it modifies. So it doesn't really matter which way you do it, but as long as you're consistent within a project and we have names for that, we call it east const, which is the, the right hand side and the west const, which is the left hand side. We'll tend to use east const here because it's, I think it's a little more logical. But as I said, older code bases and older C++ stroke C programmers like myself, quite often use uh, uh, the, 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 the West const rule. So just be aware that you may see both and it, it, it actually doesn't matter that they're, they're equivalent. Okay, there's a couple of questions here. Can we use typecast on const? So a typecast, it depends what you mean by typecast. If you mean with the typecast keyword, then we're using a typecast usually to give another name to a struct or a type. Um, const is usually, what we use, const is to do with, with, with actually the variable itself, the object that we're actually using, not so much the type. Is um, hash defined part of C++ like in C? And can it do calculations in the line? You are, well, yes, because the, um, the, the C pro processor is still available to, um, to uh, um, C++ in the same way as it is to C. And in fact, as you saw that, the hash include line is the C process, preprocessor. So yes, you can have hash defines inside C++ code. And we'll see an example of it later for guard statements, as we call them, uh, for, for uh, to you know um, to stop as multiple uh, including a, fi a file multiple times so yes you absolutely can do that um, and can you do calculations in line yes but with an inline statement and the ability to do that you you probably sh should be using a function with an inline uh, keyword on it I, it doesn't guarantee that it'll inline it um, but it's a very heavy hint and the trouble with macros is that if you're not careful what you're doing um, you may not get the execution you expect. So you need to be really careful if you're doing function like um, calculations in, in, in a function. And also functions are not type aware, so you can pass anything to it and it just does a text, it's just a text expansion, right? So it just takes whatever is in your, your, your macro definition and just uh, expands it into the source code. So you just need to be really careful what you're doing there because it's not, even though they might look like functions, they're not functions. They're just literally expansion of the text with some parameters in it. Okay, um, we're going to discuss references now because they're, they're really important um, in C++ and it, I think it's good for us to, to get an understanding of how we use them and, and what they are. I'll come back to some of the other questions in the chat uh, um, once, we've, once we've covered this. So I sort of mentioned earlier about C++ and, and memory management and um, you can't really escape this in C++ and by default, um, when we when we assign a variable a new value, C++ will attempt to copy it, okay? Um, now, with regard to something like the, the example here, double copy equals original, that's, that, that's not really uh, an issue, and that's what we expect. Um, you know, we take the value of original and we insert it in, into copy. Um, and if we pass a value of some type into a function, 
it gets copied to the local variable, as I said, it was technically in what's called the stack frame, where the, uh, the parameters are and also the local variables. So uh, here, um, you know, we've, we've got some function called advance one time step, and it has uh, an argument or parameter uh, um, called old, and we pass it in current state. Then current state gets copied inside that function um, uh, before uh, it, 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 the rest of the, the, the body of that function executes. So C++ has, this con con has a concept of a reference. So uh, a reference is a name that aliases an already existing object. That's, that's important. So it, it, as I said, it, it's, it's, it's a reference to uh, a, a, another object. An object here being any uh, block of memory that could be an int, a real, a float, or, a, or, or, or an actual object that's been returned from a constructor from a class. So we're not just talking about classes here. We're, we're talking about any of the types. It must be in, a reference must be initialized. Um, as it says, function arguments are initialized by calling. In other words, when they copy the value into it, and the reference once it's bound or to an, to, a, to an object, it cannot be rebound. Uh, I see the question there about copying to re, uh, to a new variable, and, um, and you're talking about Python. I have to do a deep copy. I'll come back to this question. Um, once we've gone through this this section, I, hopefully we'll we'll start to it start to make more sense, and then we can answer this question the question about sort of copying and deep copy later. Okay, so um, here we see in scale vector we're, we're taking two uh, parameters. Um, we're taking which uh, sorry a scale which is a double, and then we'll take a standard a reference to a standard vector. Um, and uh, which is x, and we've not put the, the body code in here just for brevity, but we're effectively going to multiply every element of x by by the scale. So when we we, we call it, um, we we're passing in the the the, the, the minus one point zero and then data. Now here, what's happening is the vector data is not is not actually is not going to copy data again. Uh, when it when it when it calls scale vector, what it's act, actually going to do is pass the reference to it, and uh, therefore a scale vector actually has access to that same uh, block of memory that contains the data. Um, this is kind of similar to C, where we pass a pointer to. Uh, 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 an object, but the uh, references, as I say, can't be rebound, and they have they have other benefits over 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 um, pointers. So we we should really use references in C plus plus. Now, um, as I said, to, to create a reference, we just qualify the type, and in this case, it was the scale vector double there, um, and um, I think I've already mentioned it has to be initialized. So we, we have to we, we, we have to make sure that um, we can't declare a reference variable without it. We have we have to make it uh, it has to be initialized. So in other words, it has to be a parameter like this, or it has to be declared with a value. Okay. As we said, we can qualify the reference as a console. We've, we've already really covered that. So if we put uh, a const reference like this, um, then the advanced one time step can't modify the contents of old. It can read them, it can access them, but it can't modify them. And the compiler will give an error if you try to change it, or if you call a function that tries to change it. This is this is what I'm saying. It, it, it by being able to use const with a reference, it, um, it we we can we can ensure that we can optimize effectively how we pass complex types around without um, uh, 
creating issues for them uh, in terms of being updated by code that we, you know, we really shouldn't be updating it. So whatever we, we, we can, we should make sure we pass a constant reference, yeah, a constant reference like that, so that we get a compiler error if we try and update it. Because you can make, you, you may be doing something where you're reading a, 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 an object, um, but somewhere else um, that object is being used and it shouldn't really be updated. So, so we, we, should, we should always always make our references constant as much as possible. And just like how we can pass um, a uh, reference to a function, we can return references. And the example here is that um, we may have data members that we want to let um, clients, as we call them, uh, have access to, but we don't necessarily want to copy the data. And um, so what we can do is we can, re we can create a uh, member function that's public, and we can return a const reference to it, as we can see here with get charge. So what this means is we can safely return that reference because we, because it's const, we can't the, the, the client code can't then up, update the, pardon me, the internal representation or the you know the actual um, charge uh, uh, vector. Um, it can't update it. It can use it, but it can't update it. So we can get the, the performance benefit of being able to access it directly. But, but with the safety of not being able to update it without calling a, a member function within the atom list. So we've got quite a lot, we've got a lot of control with C++ over how we allow access to uh, class member variables. You know, we could, we could have a, we could have, we could have a series of member functions that actually give, you know, actually iterate for us and, and, and uh, you know, perform updates ourselves. Or we can we can pass back a constant reference and allow the client uh, code access to it. It really depends on what we're trying to achieve and also what you know regards high performance codes. Um, you know we, we may want to just get passed back the vector, but as I say, uh, we want to read it rather than update it. Uh, anything that updates it should really go through a public interface. Okay. The disadvantage of this approach is you're exposing an inter the internal representation uh, in the public interface here. So um, if we were to change what that vector um, charge was, say from double to, I don't know, a, a, a class, um, it may be that um, you know, we, we would then have to change the client code, which wouldn't be ideal. As I say, um, for performance reasons, returning these const references is quite is kind of common, especially if we're we're dealing with containers. So, you, when we um, declare a variable with auto, we we can actually use references too. So the first line there says auto x. Well, that's a modifiable copy. So anything. That x is made equal to um, will just be a copy that we can modify because we actually have a copy. If we use the auto ampersand ampersand space x, then what it's saying here is, and this is um, sort of some C sugar if you want to call it that, um, it, 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 you, you will get a reference to whatever um, x is equal to, but we'll get the same constness as the initializer. Um, so, so that allows us to basically declare x as a reference, but not not define what x's constness is or the reference is. Or if we use the last one here, auto const ampersand x, then we're getting a reference to the original item, and we're saying that it's constant, so we won't modify it. And we should use, as, as I keep saying, we should use the, la the, the last wherever possible. We should always use constants uh, wherever we can. So if we know we're not going to update that X reference, then um, we, sh we should make it a constant. Uh, 
And the, the, that auto ampersand, ampersand is called a, a forwarding reference. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that again later. Okay. Are there any other sort of questions around references anybody wants to wants to ask at this point? No. Cool. Can I have auto in the public? In what sense? Yes, because it's 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 effectively just a type specifier, like like anything else. Um, when you're designing classes, it's really quite an art. Uh, the the, the Sans book covers that quite well. There's a number of, of books that actually help you understand good design practice. I would say that Mayer's book, uh, Effective C++, is a good is a good is a really good book, which will give you more information on how you should set up your interfaces into classes. Um, you know, and how you should use the syntax of C++ to help uh, create um, maintainable uh, uh, classes and also, um, you know, uh, give, uh, address some of the performance issues. So I, I highly recommend, if you want to think about this in more detail, look at that Mayor's book. Um, you, 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 uh, the question here is whether you could... Um, uh, can you apply this logic from C++ to other languages? Yes, in some ways, um, but the one thing about C++ is, is it, it has a lot of features that aren't necessarily um, available in, in other languages. But uh, there's a book, um, it's rather expensive, um, by a chap called Real, R-I-E-L, -E called Object Oriented Heuristics. And it goes, and it's for any language. It's for any object-oriented language, and it has a, a whole series of what we call heuristics, or, or, or guides, or um, sort of rules you should apply to designing classes. So if you really want to look at something that is talking about OO design, then that book is the book that would, would, would give you an understanding of the kind of heuristics. It generally talks about things like don't make data public. It talks about why you shouldn't use protected me um, member functions. Um, there's a there's a subtlety there, and and so that book's is good. I will, I, I will, I will put the name of that book in the um, pad uh, once, once we, once we finish. Um, so on the, uh, the notepad, I will, I will put a reference to that book. Yeah, no problem. As I say, it's quite, it's quite expensive, but it's a really good book. That you, if you search for it, you'll see some people have put some of the, uh, some of the um, heuristics online because they discuss them. So it, it's quite good. Okay. Returning to compilation, so I've talked a lot about declaration and definition, and the C++ does distinguish between these two. So a declaration tells a compiler that a name exists, what kind of entity it is, so in other words, it's, um, and uh, if it's a functional variable, it's type. Um, so it says here, for most uses, this is all the compiler needs. Um, they can be repeated as long as they match exactly. Generally, though, you 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 want to just declare uh, a, an entity once, yeah. And then a definition tells the compiler everything it needs to create something uh, in its entirety. It's all it says it's also a declaration in a sense, but uh, the one definition rule says that definitions must not be repeated. Yeah, there are exceptions to this. Um, but generally, that's correct. So we, I would, I would say that, de that you, generally you would have one declaration and one definition. And we'll, we'll, we'll see see what we mean by this in a second. So, what does this all mean? So we, we there was uh, questions about this in in the chat. So conventionally. Um, we put declarations of functions and definitions of classes and global constants in our header files. And as we, as we mentioned, it can be .hpp or .h or .capital H. 
again, I, I would I, I would say that it's good practice if you're using C++ to use .hpp simply because when you look at it in the file system, you'll know it's it, it's got C++ code in it, not straight C code. And then definitions of most functions should be implemented in implementation files. And the suffixes there are, as I said, .cpp or .cxx or .cc or .c. I would tend to use .cpp. And headers can be uh, hash include other files that need to use the types and the, 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 the functions that are declared there. So it's quite often to look at a, a, an HPP file and it'll have, um, it'll include other header files and it'll have new uh, uh, declarations. Yeah, I think a point to note is the suffixes are mostly meaningless to the, compli uh, to, to the compiler, um, but I would use the convention.hpp and .cpp. Okay, let's look at an example. So for example, our, our complex, uh, the, the definition of our complex uh, class or struct, as we've called it here, because everything's uh, default public, except for the two member variables, which we've marked as private in this case. Um, inside this complex to HPPV function, we have the macro uh, definitions here. So we have, if, not defined complex underscore HPP, then we define it. And um, if it's not defined, then that code gets included into the body of whatever does include complex HPP. And the reason for these two statements at the top and the statement at the bottom is what we call a guard statement. So if we have multiple source um, files, uh, multiple include files, and they include the same uh, header files, we don't want multiple copies of struct complex because what will happen is we'll get a compiler error. And this guard statement, as it's called, prevents that. It says, well, if I've already, def if I've not defined it, define it and include the code. And then the next time we include it, it'll say, oh, it is defined. So therefore it won't include the body of the, of, of, of the text there. And so you'll only get one copy. So that's how we manage it. And I think that answers the earlier question we had, which was, can we use if defs, et cetera, in C++, yes, we can. And actually, as in C, when we do header files like this, we put these guard statement, the statements in using this to protect our code. Uh, it's a question there. Can you retrieve parts of a header file similar to, mm, mm, right, not using, not using hash include? No, hash include will pull in everything. It's, it, it's the C preprocessor that's going on here. It's actually the old school uh, uh, preprocessor that has the C macro definition language that actually does it. So C++ is just leveraging it in this example. Um, C++ 20, I think, defines modules, but we're, we're not going to cover them here. And the modules are more, more akin to what you're expecting in Python. Here, this is just straight textual um, uh, uh, inclusion. How does the if and f def cycle work in compared to pragma once? Um, it's not it's not really to do with that. It's just straight, as I said, it's the C preprocessor. Basically, as we mentioned right at the beginning, the C preprocessor gets called first, looks for these statements with hash in them on the first line, uh, first character of the line, and it does something. And then it it it, it then expands that text and then passes it off to the C++ compiler proper, if you like. So what's happening here is it literally is just going to include this. If it sees that statement, if and def, it checks to see whether complex underscore HPP has been defined. If not, it defines the value, and then it uh, includes that text straight into um, your, your, your other file. So effectively, what happens is your, your CPP file that has done this include has just grown in size by the, the amount we've got here. Does that sort of make sense? Cool, it's, it's really primitive, which is why we've got those def statements, and if, def, uh, if n defs. It's primitive, but useful. Okay, 
So um, I think we've covered everything now. Um, if there's other questions uh, before we you, you, you start the exercise, um, it'd be good to cover them off. Let me go back through the chat and see which ones I've missed and what we can answer. So Matt, you asked a question of why do we define the member function does in the CPP instead of the HPP? So the reason um, for using the header files is that allows us to reference the uh, the classes, um, the functions, um, and any constants in other code. Okay. And then what we what we can do is in the CPP file we can create the code that actually de de declares those functions and put them in a library so that we can link them as one uh, to uh, the client code. So it allows us to separate out the um, referencing of those in our own code from the implementation in a library, let's say. Just looking at that example, Luca. Ah, right. Um, uh, because it's implicit, it's going to implicitly pass it as a as as a reference. Um, it's it's not the same as C, where in, in C you you declare the parameter as a pointer and you also pass it as a pointer. So the great thing about using references is is, is it looks like you're passing the actual object itself, and it, it implicitly is passing the reference. That's why. I think it would be a good time to try those examples. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Good. Yeah. My my headphone bad. Um, so I think if we call that lunch and say people try exercises from now and we will come back. So I will come back from just before half one and we can discuss any issues with that. And then we can start the next session around uh, half past. OK. Do you want me to just quickly cover off? The, this question here about vectors. Yeah, if you want to, that's fine. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly, I'll just quickly cover that off. So, so the vectors, um, and actually, yes, I, I, I think probably it is slightly confusing here. So, where we've got standard colon colon vector angle bracket double angle bracket, what we're saying is we're going to create a, a an object of class vector that um, has doubles as the data element yeah so they're effectively a standard class that um, wrap um, what you might call an array but they're effectively a, 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 a C++ standard library uh, um, compound object does that sort of make sense does that help I'm thinking Charlie and Ed who asked the question The next session is on containers, which will cover vectors in there. That's why it's kind of cool. Cool. We'll, we'll, effectively, Ch Charlie, yes, that's correct. And uh, as, as we said, we'll, we'll, we'll cover them later. Uh, there are a number of advantages which we'll cover later, but uh, yes, it, that's what it is. We're, we're, we're instantiating a class to give us an object which has a double list in it.
great. Well, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. I think. Go ahead, pull that there. Um, I will. Yeah. So I will return at sort of half one, and we'll start by just discussing the, uh, the example. Um, you should know if it's working because you should be able to run the test. Complex exercises page is not working. Okay, I'll have a look now. Um, but the idea is that you should be able to um, run make on the test example, and it should let you know if you've passed and got things working correctly. 